Welcome everyone to the Daily Dose podcast. This is the podcast where we discuss things from the news and social media that's interesting to us as business nerds and as entrepreneurs. I'm James and I'm joined by my co-host Marcelo. Hi mate, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Uh, this week uh, we've got three topics for you. Two from some tweets which I came across, uh, my standard operating procedure and uh, one sort of larger newsworthy topic that's in the news at the moment in the middle of September 2020. Um, First up, um, a tweet about sales tactics, and this is applicable to people who are just starting out in business or have got sort of a growing small business. And it's a guy for a, uh, called Riley Chase, and uh, he basically writes. It's a long Twitter thread, and it's it's quite a good one to uh, read. So we'll link it up in the show notes. Um, but he's talking about the difference between short-term sales tactics and long-term sales tactics. And he's replying to a different tweet from a few years ago, which is basically uh, another company was saying like, when your first zero to 10 customers, then it's going to be 90% short term sales tactics. And as you grow, the longer term sales tactics are going to take over from the short term sales tactics. So they were saying, once you get to 100 plus customers, then the longer term sales tactics are likely going to be winning out over the short term ones. Whereas this guy, Riley Chase is saying, well, actually, he's just hit 1000 customers. Um, or over a thousand customers and he's done that primarily on the short-term sales tactics so he's going into why that is in his case and also like what the difference between some of those are um, and I think I mean not only does it show that you know it's horses for courses different things work in different areas um, but he had um, a couple of interesting lists of what the short and long-term tactics are so the short-term tactics which he's been uh, using with success is things like the founder handling every support call. So you're answering the phone, you're answering the emails, you're doing everything yourself. You know, it's that personal touch. Uh, the second one is visiting in person. So, you know, if you've got some sort of service business and you're in the same local area, actually going out and visiting the people who are your potential clients. And that's, again, that is the short term ones tend to be this personal touch. Uh, and next one is personal follow-ups. So this is if someone gets in contact, then you follow up personally. If someone has bought something, then you follow up personally. And this final one is mining your personal connections. So that's going through your social, you know, your Facebook, your LinkedIn, your Twitter, that kind of stuff, and reaching out to people who are directly in your personal networks for uh, to see if they want to become customers and see if you can convert them. So, so that's what he classes as the short-term sales tactics. Long term, he's talking about things like cold calling, cold emailing. You go out, you prospect a list of people that you've never contacted before and you contact them out the blue with some kind of good offer, trying to get them into your funnel. Uh, another one is drip email campaigns. So this is when people turn up to your website or otherwise sign up uh, for your service and you gradually sell them over time with a drip, drip, drip of emails that are valuable to them and eventually end in some sort of call to action or an ask. Uh, another one's SEO, again, something which is uh, a much longer lead time kind of effort. You've got to put in six to nine months before you start seeing results on that one. But again, you start to see ongoing results. Uh, and the final one under long term um, is scalable lead gen campaigns. So this is, can you work um, a system? It might be, for example, paid ads on Facebook. Can you get the right ads, the right um cost per action, the right funnel, the right landing page, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to have this sort of constant and crankable machine that you can sort of put money in one end and get leads out the other end and then convert those leads, not necessarily personally, but either via a, a funnel or a system or by other salespeople that you've hired or uh, outsourced, something like that. Um, so Marcelo, you uh, have run a few businesses in your time. What What's kind of success or otherwise have you seen with short versus long-term um, uh, tactics in this area? Yeah, so I would say that um, it's, um, it's not fixed, you know, uh, so strategies in general are, are, are not universal. There's no universal recipe, depends on your industry as well. Um, I agree they are short term and long term. And actually, his example was uh, very good that uh, a tweet from a few years ago used to say the first hundred customers require like short term selling uh, tactics. Um, but this guy was saying uh, my first thousand customers were uh, achieved by doing short-term selling tactics. So I think as it, uh, especially uh, as as it you know it grows competition online, it will be more and more important for you to be to to be there, just facing the customer, having a personal touch, um, uh, and I think that's becoming necessary. Um, I would say. Uh, 
even that nowadays uh, the uh, it's I mean it's very hard to just go buy your way in into any market. So and it's also hard to build like a super outstanding product uh, that is way better than anything else because it requires a lot of money and and you know and uh, and sharp coordination and execution. Um, so then your your main or your best shot would be to build a community. Uh, so and that starts by dealing directly with the people. So first finding as cheap as possible and as direct as possible the people who are mo most likely to be interested in your product in uh, in you as as a founder or uh, the sales guy of that company. So uh, in your company's you know mission or uh, proposition uh, and then build it from there. So they will tell others. So there is great books uh, from Seth Godin. Uh, he's a brilliant marketer, uh, US-based, and uh, yeah, he has several books like Purple Cow. Uh, on, on, but he's a uh, yeah very uh, enthusiast of tribes and on um, yeah, um, almost uh, he's almost saying that that's your only way <laughs> actually to. Uh, yeah, do this short-term selling, uh, I would say, from, yeah, there are many ways to do it, but it will involve your personal dedication, uh, time-wise, uh, resource-wise, to listen to these people and reply to what they want and, you know, share them your personal contact details um, and create that initial uh, tribe or community that they do uh, like your product and they will be your ambassadors and they will tell others that they, and that will kick in and then you then you will have a mailing list that you can send to uh, and that that will grow and, and as you get more resources you can pay someone to do seo which will bring more results over time and this and that so uh yeah if you were to invest your time uh just invest it in yeah your customers i would say uh initially uh, even is as important or even more than on the product development i would say yeah i think uh, i think this speaks to um an aphorism in sort of startups which i think is was probably a quote from paul graham um which is do things that don't scale so part of your superpower when you're small and agile is having the bandwidth and being able to do stuff that the bigger boys can't do because they have to have scalable systems. And when you have scalable systems and you lose, as you said, some of that personalization, some of that thing. And, and the idea is, is that at every stage of your growth, you want to be doing stuff that the others aren't prepared to do because they can't do it. It doesn't move the needle enough. Um, it, you know, it costs them too much money. They don't have the personal bandwidth to do it, whatever it might be. And that what helps you stand out from the crowd, right? If you're willing to go the extra mile and do the personal touch, then you're, far more likely to engage with your customers and get them in the door and then the more customers you've got the more money so you know you ride that horse until it doesn't work anymore and then you jump on the next one you ride that horse till it doesn't work anymore etc etc and you ladder your way up the scale um i mean there's a very famous companies that have done this of course so um a famous example i think is um airbnb so they when they were starting out um quite early on in the New York market, one of the things which they knew would help them stand out from their competitors would be the quality of their listings. And so they, they hired professional photographers to go around to each of the new listings places to take professional photos of the places. They went themselves with like high quality cameras to take photos of, you know, in their local vicinity of um, all of the places that are on Airbnb, just so that the Airbnb listings looked, you know, 10x better than the Craigslist listings or the whatever the competition might be. Now, of course, that doesn't that doesn't really scale, but it gets you that sort of next step up the ladder. Next up, we've got um, a tweet from a guy called Mike Volpe, which I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, he is one of the first hires at HubSpot. I think he ended up being the chief marketing officer there. Um, and I think he's now an investor of some note. Um, and his tweet... Um, was quite interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. So I'll, I'll read it out here first. He says, uh, Dropbox is SharePoint, but better. Zoom is WebEx, but better. Airtable is QuickBase, but better. Salesforce is Siebel, but better. Sometimes you don't need to invent something totally new. Um, now, depending upon your age, you may or may not know what the, uh, the second names are in all those lists. Um, 
But I think the point here that he's illustrating is that, um, which is something that we talked about before, which is to do with um, you don't have to go and create something completely new in a market in order to, um, you know, become an entrepreneur or to have success in you know, building your own business. In actual fact, the fact that some other people are already in the market and being successful in the market is actually a good signal that a, a market exists and B they're willing to spend money on solving the problem. Um, and that you can compete in a market by out executing your competition or by having an edge on your competition, be it through technology or execution or some other angle that they're coming at it from, because all of those companies listed second there were huge companies in their day. And many of them are still, you know, large, many hundreds of millions of dollars sized company, but the, the other companies that have overtaken them started out as tiny little one, two, three person companies and have grown to eclipse what were previously the giant companies in those areas. So don't think that just because, you know, you're entering a market where there's a huge competitor that's got infinitely more money than you've got, that that is impossible for you to compete or that you can't, or it's a bad idea to enter that market. Particularly if you can look, for example, and find, um, markets that are growing in total size so google trends is a good place to sort of get a signal for that you can go to google trends type in some keywords related to the market you're interested in and just see what the search history is over the last few years if it's up and to the right that means it's a growing market meaning that there's there's increasing space in that market for competitors sure the big guy is growing but also the proportion available for the little guys getting bigger and bigger and bigger you know you may only you may enter a market and they may only be, only be $10 million for you to sort of grab because someone else has got like $200 million of that market. But if that market 10 X is in size, then your 10 million goes to a hundred million. And you know, you can ride that wave of the growth of the market as well as your own sort of personal growth as a company. Um, have you had an experience of this kind of thing? Oh yeah. I stick to uh, something we talked before on, as you said, uh, that there are two ways uh, to you know, uh, launch a successful business. Either you um, improve an existing product uh, uh, 10x, so 10 times or more, uh, so it's significantly better and you will do very well. Uh, or you improve something slightly, uh, so incremental, but it's utilitarian, so it's something that affects a lot of people. Um, so it could be on the like the 5G example with telcos, like everyone has a phone, or it could be something in you know energy or any kind of that stuff. So anything, um, yeah, like moving, you know, even uh, electric, uh, uh, like batteries on cars. So um, yeah, so it's uh, some technology improvement because cars are still cars, you know. Even aside the self-driving, which is not fully, uh, you know, autonomous yet, uh, the car is still the car, so it will take you at the same pace and this and that. So, but a slight technology improvement uh, it meant that Tesla is the large, the most valued company, car company in the world, uh, because long term uh, it will create a, 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 an impact, a better impact. Um, but. Um, yeah, so uh, and I will also endorse what you were saying, uh, that if there is a market there uh, and it's already good news, uh, it, it should be like a uh, you know, red flag if there's no one doing what you want to do. Uh, and that increases your risk, I would say. And something we talked before as well is on, on previous podcasts is... Um, um, yeah, yeah, the risk on the co communication on something completely new, because if it, you know, we all as humans run and go our day by uh, reasoning by analogy. You know, you compare this and that. Otherwise, it is it's, it's, it's too much information, and and you don't want to spend too much time thinking when you are going to buy something, or you don't want as an entrepreneur to put that pressure on. On the on the customer that friction because it's gonna it's not gonna play in your favor. So uh, the cost of communicating something completely new and completely different uh, it's it's gonna it's gonna be super high. So you rather take something that's working in a market that's growing and make it way better. So yeah, I think that's a good strategy for sure. Cool. Next up, um, a couple of bits of. Uh, news that have come out in the previous uh, couple of days at the time of recording. We're recording this on the 15th of September, 2020. 
Um, and they seem somewhat unrelated, but I think they do have a relation. So the first up is um, TikTok, the uh, Marcelo's favorite app, um, <laughs> is um, being sold um, because the American government is effectively forcing the uh, ByteDance, the Chinese company, which owns TikTok, um, to sell it. Otherwise, they're going to shut it down, playing a bit of geopolitics there. Um, and it's just been announced that uh, Microsoft um, ha had put in a bid, which has been turned down. And it's increasingly looking likely that Oracle is going to be successful in possibly purchasing it. The actual sort of terms of the deal seem very, very fuzzy from what I can see. There's in their press release, there isn't any sort of mention of the term purchase, but sort of partnership. So we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, and the other bit of news which happened very recently, um, which may or may not go through depending, depending upon regulators and things like that, is that Arm Holdings, the chip manufacturer, or sorry, the, the chip designer, um, which was previously owned by SoftBank, which they bought um, lock, stock and barrel for $32 billion, is being sold to NVIDIA, which is another uh, chip designer, uh, graphics, uh, CPU, uh, GPU, sorry, um, designer, and also very highly involved in sort of like the machine learning hardware and things like that. They're buying it from SoftBank for $40 billion. And that's caused um, quite a big hoo-ha, both in the tech space, because um, Arm was always a very independent entity. A lot of companies use and license um, the Arm designs for their chips. So Apple famously use it. I, most everyone uses it, to be honest. It's, it's a very sort of standard thing to use. Um, but the NVIDIA are very much not uh, an independent-minded kind of company. They're, they've just overtaken Intel as the largest um, chip maker um, in the US. Um, and they're on a bit of a tear. And there's, so there's a big sort of worries. Um, and the reason why these two things are related is to do with um, the sort of geopolitics of the situation. So um, Arm was a British company um, based out of Cambridge in the UK. Um, it originally came about um, in the 1980s where Apple and Acorn computers came together and sort of launched this side project, which became ARM. And it was considered to be sort of the jewel in the tech crown of the um, sort of UK tech market. Um, and then there was a lot of um, fuss made when SoftBank bought it. So SoftBank are the Japanese sort of super fund. Um, because essentially, you know, you are moving um, a large kind of countrywide asset out effectively out of the country even though or ownership has moved out of the country even though sort of the headquarters and everything else remain where they are but you're sort of like losing that um technology to sort of a a different part of the world uh and this and nvidia as well it being sold to nvidia exactly the same they're an american company um and so you know there's there's a transfer and they're not necessarily going to sort of keep the headquarters and the and the sort of employment guarantees in the uk and things like that um and the same thing with tiktok right so uh, TikTok, um, Chinese company, the American government is particularly keen to clamp down on it because of data data issues. They're worried about sort of vast hundreds of millions of videos of Americans dancing stupidly as suddenly going to be, you know, utilized by the Chinese government for some nefarious purpose. Uh, I'm not sure what, but, you know, I'm sure maybe blackmail videos or something like that, blackmail <clears throat> for the bad dance moves. Um, but essentially it's people playing, playing, uh, Geopolitics, and there's also some suggestion about the fact between why Oracle is being preferred over Microsoft might have to do with the sort of political leanings of the various people involved in those companies, and da 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 da. da. So it, it's all very complicated, and it's all a little bit political. But um, I thought it was quite interesting. What, what do you think about these situations? Yeah, yeah. The question is, what the heck is going on, basically? <laughs> so it's hard to, as you said, to figure it out uh, because it's it's happening behind the scenes. Uh, lots of information is not public. Uh, uh, yeah, I would say it's different. Uh, they are related, as you said. Yeah, on probably the link. Uh, so, so the main difference is that one uh, buyout or partnership was forced by a nation, or in, in this case, the US, like first of its kind. So it's a one of its kind uh, event. Uh, whereas the other is like a private transaction. So it's not, uh, you know, um, something new, although uh, probably the link to both from the geopolitical stuff you mentioned is uh, that increasingly these super mega corporations are like countries as well, like have, their influence is so big that it's 
they are as powerful, you know, as, as, as nations, uh, definitely more powerful than many nations. Uh, so, and that many politicians. So um, that's, uh, that's an issue, probably also open question to uh, the UK government, because, you know, the US is trying to play uh, the cards, you know, to, to improve their odds uh, or, or their, you know, uh, countries growth on technology uh, dominance etc China is doing is very protective as well and the UK is just letting go every company so uh, and it's hard already to uh, to build those companies in uh, like a, uh, a smaller you know island basically uh, you have a smaller market etc um, but um, so, so it's already hard and once you, they let go deep mind we talked about that before uh, now with ARM, ARM was already, already listed, but I mean, eventually, if you are the government, you can intervene, you can put money on it, you know, try to, try to be a, like a, 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 a shareholder in the company. So then they can, maybe SoftBank couldn't sell it like now or this and that, you know, you, you will have a vote and you will make everyone also uh, to, to, to benefit from uh, the, the success of local companies. Uh, so all the taxpayers. So then you have all these, you know, sovereign funds uh, in many nations that are doing exactly that. So uh, yeah, big question mark on that. Should should you be just 100% liberal and, and 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 let the markets decide, or you are just letting go your main assets when everyone else is super protected? So um, and when it comes to the Oracle uh, deal. That's interesting as well because there was uh, always this um, rivalry, I would say, and, uh, and, and stiff competition between the founder of uh, Oracle, uh, Larry Ellison, and Bill Gates, or, or just the founders of Microsoft. So uh, it's, it's interesting, the timing on this. Um, but of course, they're uh, partnering with uh, private equity guys, I think Silver, Le Silver Lake uh, and others. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not clear what's the deal behind. I'm sure that they're, I mean, Trump is treating it like a private transaction. Uh, and he even claimed that uh, the, uh, the, the Fed should get a cut or the, someone <laughs> in government. Um, so uh definitely i wouldn't be surprised i'm not saying definitely but probably uh, uh most likely there will be you know uh political uh implications there or or affinity involved uh yeah why not uh it's there is it's very also public the case on uh uh there was this um the big defense contract that uh aws so amazon was uh, the, the clear uh, or the you know a, a front runner uh, almost they almost closed the deal and last minute uh, I think Microsoft strike uh, from it and it was argued that it was because of the you know bad relationship between Bezos and and Trump so uh, yeah that was that that system was called Jedi <laughs> EDI <laughs> yeah yeah there you go and so yeah I would differentiate. Um, also, it's, uh, it will be interesting to see, regardless who is the buyer of TikTok or partner or whatever, uh, leaving that aside, it, uh, apparently the main technology is not going to be sold, which is the algorithm on why it's so sticky and this and that. Um, so then, um, yeah, I'm not so sure um, how that will play out. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but um, also, it, it will be interesting I think it will get too technical on how the data is protected um, and it will be hard to assess if it's protected at all. Uh, definitely won't give uh, US or it won't stop China from developing, you know, um, competitive advantage from a technology point of view. I think, uh, or um, actually recently, um, this guy, Eric Smith from the former uh, CEO of Google, he came, uh, he talked to a BBC, uh, he was uh, pointing out that the US is dropping the ball, uh, and I'm just paraphrasing him, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, leading the, you know, uh, being a tech superpower or the main tech superpower in the world, and that China has been able to catch up because of the US 
cutting on R&D. That it used to be 2% of the GDP, but they started cutting down that and this and that. And by policy, they just um, let it go or are letting it go. So um, it, that's, that's something also we talked before. So should governments be you know, involved? So how, yeah, it was a, a, an open question on why the EU doesn't have big tech. Like why only China and Europe, uh, sorry, China and the US. So, uh, and the question was, should government get involved? Uh, so the EU has R&D budget, but um, yeah, I, I do think it, it, it should, the governments get involved uh, at, at, or create the ecosystem we're talking about because it takes time to trigger that positive feedback loop. You know, the entrepreneurs who exited and put the money back and also coach these new entrepreneurs and, and the, with the VCs and, and it, you know, on some government support or tax relief, so it kicks in. Um, yeah, I think uh, that uh, Europe should, should do better, the UK especially. Um, and Eric was saying that actually when, when asked specifically the hard question, so uh, can't China and US work together uh, rather than compete? He said that the need to compete to get better each other and it's, um, but when it needs to collaborate, they will because it's yeah, sometimes it's like you know, common sense or just inevitable that they need to collaborate. Uh, so um, that probably was the political correct question, <laughs> especially talking to the BBC. Uh, but it doesn't look like that, um, in, you know, uh, in, in the field. So. Um, yeah, it's it's a bit. Uh, so if you start manipulating, you know, free markets, uh, that's a bit dangerous, I would say. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's interesting to see how threatened U.S. now feels from China's technology and how that's starting to change. And China is very aggressive on how they are going out there and into the U.S. market as well to try to dominate with all sorts of things, apps and. And I would say beyond uh, uh, technology, they will, they are just going for it with, they are tra transitioning what Japan did in the old days from being, you know, seen as the cheap option um, to now be, you know, the, like that top player on, on quality designs, manufacturing, etc. So manufacturing is being more relocated to Vietnam now, etc. Whereas, I mean, from, from uh, the ones who want cheap manufacturing, but China is, dominant in the supply chain anyway. Uh, so highly skilled people uh, and, and lots of infrastructure. Um, some other are, are, are like arenas to see this competition between US and China is in the space race where US have all these you know, uh, private companies uh, pumped by NASA of course, but just as a, let's say public private enterprise going together uh, into space. Uh, whereas China is just all state funded, uh, but this is having some impressive, you know, uh, stuff getting done. So they went to the back side of the moon, they're throwing some entangled protons <laughs> to space and uh, they're planning to go to Mars or they already shoot something to Mars, um, which is very sophisticated as well. And they are, and one of the reasons that, you know, it, they were saying probably the US has better technology uh, but China uh, has all the components and manufacturing in the, within the country. So the entire supply chain for whatever they want to build, including rockets, uh, they do it in China. So then it costs them um, uh, about the same. So even if it's less efficient uh, from a technology point of view, they get it done uh, with similar costs. So if you, if you keep iterating and improving that, eventually uh, yeah, it will be hard to compete with. But uh, yeah, let's see. Um, uh, there's lots going on. Uh, I think uh, yeah, SoftBank is uh, an interesting case. It's piloting everywhere. Um, it has a lot of influence for sure. Um, so it will be interesting to see yeah, where, where, it could be an indication on where things are going as well. 
Cool. All right. Thanks so much for that. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We're back every Tuesday and Thursday. Please check out our YouTube channel, which is where we post this podcast and our other videos. You can search for net workers. That's two words. Or you can find the link in the show notes for this podcast. If you're interested in help, mentorship, and courses for entrepreneurship and starting businesses, please do check out our website, which is at networkers.co. See you all next time. Bye. Thanks.